Right, so we've seen splitting occur, we've seen splitting in action, but there are cases where splitting patterns are not as simple as a, a, a singlet, a doublet, a triplet, a quartet, and so on. And so it would be nice to explain and explore how more complicated splitting patterns may arise. And to do it, I'm going to start with a straightforward splitting pattern, um, and that is looking at the central hydrogen here, this proton here, which in the proton NMR appears as a triplet. It appears as a triplet because we follow our n plus 1 rule and we look and we can see it's got two neighbors and 2 plus 1 is 3 and there is a triplet sitting over there. But how is this triplet built up? Well, we can start by saying looking at the left-hand side, looking at the left-hand neighbor of B. If we have B alone, if B had no labors, then it would be a singlet. There is B alone sitting over there. However, in the presence of the single neighbor on the left, the proton on the left, it would split into two. Notice I'm ignoring C. If it was only in the presence of A, it would split into two. And that's why you see two vertical lines here, because it has split into two because of A. Now, in this situation, I've mentioned the coupling constants. And the coupling constant between A and B is 6 hertz. So what I'm going to do is to use a ruler and uh, scale this and make sure it is maybe 6 centimeters or 6 millimeters apart, and, or a, a multiple of that, uh, to measure to show exactly the strength of that coupling. Right. Now, B has been split by A to produce these, this doublet, these two uh, peaks over here. What happens to these peaks now in the presence of C? Well, B is now a doublet. In the presence of C, those would have to split in two again. You've got one neighbor. The C neighbor is going to, it's only a single neighbor there, is going to split that doublet into two again. And so in the presence of C, you can see this side of the initial doublet splits into two, and this side of the initial doublet splits into two. Now, because the strength of coupling is identical to the one that we had before, you'll notice that the central uh, peak in the overlap overlaps um, from the left-hand coupling and the right-hand coupling giving us a greater peak in the middle and two smaller peaks. And we have built up our triplet by looking individually at the coupling due to the left-hand side and the coupling due to the right-hand side. Okay, what would happen if these interactions were slightly different to each other? And that is interesting. So have a look at a slightly different case. Now, we can't really use the n plus 1 rule for H, uh, for this proton in the center, this proton B in the center, because the neighbors interact differently with it. The neighbor on the left, neighbor A, interacts with full strength, 6 hertz uh, coupling constant. The neighbor C interacts B with B with a much weaker cup, uh, interaction and inter a coupling constant of 2 hertz. So, Let's look at the strong interaction first. And so what we have is that B in the presence, B on its, on its own would be a singlet, but B in the presence of that single neighbor on the left would split into two. So N plus one would split into two, but the distance would be six hertz. So I would choose six centimeters or an appropriate scale uh, to make sure that these two vertical lines show the doublet that would be informed and the strength of the coupling. Right, but of course uh, that, that uh, splitting is not in isolation to C. C also has an effect, so what happens to that doublet? That doublet gets split by the neighbor C into a further doublet. We've got one neighbor here, so it's got to split into two, uh, but the splitting of the initial doublet into two is going to be much weaker. So the left-hand side will be split into two, the right hand side will be split into two. There's no overlap. I would draw two centimeters here and two centimeters here or an appropriate scale. And you'll see that the splitting pattern is much more complicated. It's not 
a singlet, a doublet, a quartet, or a triplet. In fact, this here is termed a double doublet. So that's interesting. You can get these more complicated splitting patterns if the strength of interaction with one neighbor is much weaker than the strength of interaction with another neighbor. So just to summarize what we've got, B on its own would be a singlet. B gets split into a doublet by neighbor A. The distance is 6 hertz. This doublet gets split again into a doublet by neighbor C because C is a single proton. The distance is 2 hertz and the result is a more complicated splitting pattern. Right. So to give you an example um, of this kind of splitting, um, I have run a spectrum of ethanol, but not ethanol using normal solvents. I've run ethanol uh, in DMSO. And the thing with ethanol in DMSO is it prevents exchange of the OH uh, with other uh, species in solution. So the OH is no longer in fast exchange with anything. That hydrogen, that proton, is stuck to that oxygen and suddenly it has to be a neighbor. Okay, so this is a very unusual situation and normally we'll not see choose OH to be a neighbor at all, but this case we're in the presence of DMSO which is preventing the hydrogen from moving, which is forcing the hydrogen to be a neighbor. So you will see, here is the proton signal for the OH, and you will notice that unusually it is a triplet. And why is it a triplet? Why is that proton a triplet? Well, it's got two neighbors, and the n plus 1 rule tells us that it's going to split into three. Similarly, we can have a look at the methyl group. Here's a methyl group that integrates to three. That methyl group why is that a triplet? Why is it splitting into two? Well, that methyl group has got two neighbors, the CH2. N plus one rule says that it's got to split into three. However, when we try and look at the CH2 in the middle, you'll notice a highly complicated splitting pattern. So we need to try and think out how that is built up. So, have a look at the central CH2. Firstly, from its first neighbor, it's going to be split into four. It is a quartet. Can you see that CH2 has three neighbors on the left? And so that first strong splitting is going to be from that, from that CH3. And the N plus 1 rule says that will split into four. So that CH2 will split into four due to the methyl group. Right. But what will happen to those four peaks in the signal if the OH is now coupling? Well, the CH2 has a single neighbor over here that's going to split everything into two. So those, each of those four signals will be split into two. And so we expect to have four times two. We expect to have eight peaks in the splitting in the NMR spectrum. And so we can uh, count them. I can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Eight. That is due to the difference in splitting on the left and the right. Please, in this case, please remember that this is very unusual for OH to cause splitting. Please, I would like you to remember that OH, under normal circumstances, does not cause splitting. And it does not split itself because of fast exchange with solvent. So to just remind you, that in DMSO, exchange of OH stops, and this is a rare case where OH is a neighbor and couples. The CH2 gets split into four by the methyl group, and these four are split into two by the OH, making a total of eight signals. Right. Now, on a slightly different note, <coughs> the kind of solvents that we use in NMR are where all hydrogens are substituted with an isotope of hydrogen called 2H. It's deuterium. So um, note that deuterium, although it is hydrogen, it's an isotope of hydrogen, its nucleus contains a proton and a neutron. 
hydrogens only have a nucleus as a proton. So, with nuclear magnetic resonance, the gyromagnetic ratio for deuterium will be very different. It will uh, appear its llama frequency will be in a very different region of the spectrum. So we use these deuterated solvents. We use them to provide a reference frequency that does not interfere with other nuclei, such as 1H, the proton, or the carbon-13 spectrum, for example. So the common solvents we use are water, methanol, dimethyl sulfoxide, benzene, and chloroform. But of course, the isotope of hydrogen is of course 2H and so it's it's common practice to give it its own chemical symbol as D although we know really it is H with a 2 indicating the mass so can you see that this is H2O but the hydrogen we're using is a heavier version of hydrogen it's a heavier isotope so these are the common solvents that are used and so, uh, the spectrometer will pick up their frequency and the frequency, the llama frequency of these, used as a reference, is very different to the proton llama frequency or the carbon llama frequency. Okay. So we always run samples with solvents that are deuterated. All 1Hs replaced with 2H means that the solvents will not appear in the 1H spectrum. Unless, of course, the solvents have a contaminant, and that contaminant is maybe, for instance, with chloroform, the normal version of chloroform, like CHCl3. Okay. Right. So there's another use with deuterated solvents. So have a look at this at isopropyl alcohol. And again, we're at the situation where we've got the OH. The OH is not splitting. The OH does not split because it's in fast exchange. And an interesting th thing happens that if we add a drop of deuterium oxide or water with uh, the heavy isotope of hydrogen, what happens is with the fast exchange, uh, a 2H, a D, can, can exchange with the alcohol hydrogen that we have present in isopropyl alcohol. So by adding a deuterated solvent to this, these become replaced with deuterium, which does not appear on the spectrum. So adding heavy water, adding D to O to an NMR spectrum will cause your exchangeable hydrogens to disappear. So your OHs will disappear, and you can confirm it's an OH by adding just a drop of D to O to your NMR spectrum. So we've dealt with quite a lot in this a uh, particular segment, we've had a look at complicated splitting patterns and why they occur. And we've had a look also at deuterated solvents, the deuterated solvents that are used, and how these deuterated solvents can be used to identify uh, uh, exchangeable hydrogens in a compound.